Dr. Uh, Alok Bhatt. I'm, Alok, I'm going to ask that you introduce yourself. But before you do, I did just want to give a shout out. Um, you know, Alok has been one of the most active and founding members of our Eco Ambassador Program. I'll put, uh, for those of you who might be interested, I'll put the links in the chat. And we, Alok has really done uh, impressive work and taken on research, not just for his own learning, uh, but really to affect change in his community and his, the local businesses that he has gone out to talk to, uh, the kinds of changes that he wanted to see in his school. So he has done a lot of research and work surrounding single-use plastics, about meat consumption and health benefits, has done a lot of research in this past few years, and we're really lucky to have him in our Eco Ambassador Program Network. And thank you for all the work you're doing, Alok. So I'll hand it over to you now so that you can introduce yourself and introduce thank the you. panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Shin, Dr. Iyengar, Ms. Mora. Thank you all for having me today. Um, my name is Alok Bhatt. I've been an eco ambassador for, I think, four years now. And um, as you said, I, I have, um, I, I, my first project is an eco ambassador. I, I created a poster campaign to like try to tackle plastic waste in my community. I displayed the, po I was able to, I spoke, first I spoke to local businesses, tried to convince them to ask consumers to, um, asked them to, to not give plastic cutlery, but they, but then they said like, you should go to the consumer instead. So then I got, so then I created posters like targeting, like, for example, like creative, like BYOB, bring your own bag, like to encourage them to like, um, bring your own like boxes, containers when you do take out, use less plastic cutlery, et cetera. And I put these posters in my own schools and, um, I, I also like um, created a video to like reduce meat consumption in my community. And I also um, wrote a research paper on the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. In fact, one of the people who was on the panel, I had the distinct privilege of interviewing a couple of years ago, Miss Barbara Landis. And since time is of the essence, allow me to jump right in. Um, my first panelist, Dr. Miss Janita Benali, is a member of the Diné Nation, a Native American tribe located in Arizona. She, along with her brother Clayson, are members of an award-winning punk rock band, Sihasen. They use their music to tell their story about the racial environmental injustices they've suffered throughout the years. She also runs a podcast, Indigenous Youth Nation, to inspire hope in the youth in her community. I've had the distinct privilege of interviewing her exactly two years ago for the New York, New Jersey Youth Summit. My second panelist, Dr. Jack Bouchard. He is an assistant professor of history at Rutgers University in New Brunswick. He teaches environmental history with an emphasis on global and pre-modern perspectives. Dr. Bouchard is interested in the histories of pre-modern maritime environments and foodways, and researches commercial fishing, island and coastal ecologies, and changing global foodways in the 15th through 16th centuries. He's currently writing his first book, Terra Nova, Food, Water, and Work in the Early Atlantic World, A History of the Northwest Atlantic in the 16th Century. I also took his class, Age of European Global Expansion and Exploration. Favorite class at Rutgers, hands down. Anyone who goes to Rutgers, do take his course. Um, and my third panelist, Ms. Barbara Landis. She is a retired uh, Carlisle Indian Industrial School archivist and library specialist for the Cumberland County Historical Society in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. She has worked with individuals and nations to develop the www.carlisleindianschool.org biographical and research web pages. It's a great resource, hands down, for any for those looking for information on the first Native American residential school in North America. She urges those who study Carlisle to recognize the complex responses to a failed educational experiment from the descendants of school students. As a consequence of her work, Ms. Landis makes it a point to respectfully honor those students and their descendants who lived through this horrible experiment, to celebrate those who prospered from it, and to grieve those whose lives were diminished from it. She currently travels with a grant-funded team from the Carlisle Indian School Digital Resource Center, bringing programming and making visits with tribal communities and descendants of Carlisle Indian Industrial School students. Thank you all once again for being here today. Um, I would like to address my first question to Dr. Bouchard. 
I remember in your class, you mentioned terraforming, which is the act of deliberately altering the landscape and the Earth's surface for human needs. A key part of this process was the seizure and dispossession of indigenous land. Can you please give us some context and examples of terraforming throughout history, as well as its ramifications for indigenous people? Does its legacy impact them to this day? Wonderful. Uh, so, so thank you so much. I mean, I, I couldn't be more effusive in my thanks to Alec for organizing this. I, he was one of my best students, and now I've learned so much uh, about all the other amazing things he's doing. And I, I've been looking forward to this panel all week. I could go on, but I, I, I know we are pressed for time, so let me start answering. So, yes, I, I think I am um, a, a scholar of environmental history, and, and like a growing chorus of us, um, we are increasingly thinking of European colonialism and its, its descendants among settler populations in the Americas as at its heart being an ecological process. The, the, one of the major consequences, arguably the, the most fundamental legacy of European colonialism from the 14th century to the present is transforming landscapes and biology. Um, this, this is something we can see very clearly in our sources by the mid 1400s. This is a very old project and it's a global one, but it, it is most visible um, and most impactful in the Americas where many of us live. I mean, to, to, to go back to what, you know, just a few minutes ago, our student scholars were talking about in the first panel, um, the fact that we are debating the presence of European style lawns um, or European style urbanization in the United States, it points to how fundamental this is. Um, and despite how clear that sounds, it's, it's only quite recently that scholars have appreciated this fully and tried to put it at the center of how we understand colonial history. And when I teach, as Alec has suggested, I, I see value in describing this process as a history of terraforming. Um, which is typically a word we associate with the future, with science fiction, right? You know, Elon Musk will terraform Mars so we can all live on it. Uh, we will go to the stars and terraform other planets. And the point I would make is we already live on a terraformed planet. Um, since the mid 15th century, European colonialism has transformed the world we live in. And I mean, to give a couple of examples, um, I live in, in the coastal Northeast of the United States. I, I grew up in New England. I live in New Jersey. Um, all around me growing up and to this day, I can drive through a landscape that is meant to mimic rural England. Um, you know, if, if you drive around New England, there's a reason we call it New England. Um, that is unnatural, that is artificial, that is a deliberate result of settlers starting in the 17th century, cutting down forests, dispossessing and displacing indigenous populations and attempting to recreate an English countryside. Um, in the 1980s, um, the historian Alfred Crosby um, suggested that the, the, the point of European colonialism is to create a world of neo-Europe's, to, to replicate European landscapes everywhere on the planet. And in many ways, they have succeeded. Another quick example I'd give is um, the middle part of our continent, uh, what is today sort of the entire middle third of the United States and most of Canada, um, historically was a giant steppe grassland that sustained a very complex indigenous um, um, ecology and which sustained indigenous um, human communities for hundreds and thousands of years. It is now all a giant farm. Um, sort of the, the amber waves of grain in the song are a reminder that at the center of our country is a massive terraforming project over the past 150 to 180 years that has turned a grassland into a giant maize farm and cow production facility. So a, a couple quick things I'd say of why I think this is important for us to, to understand and to teach our students. Um, the key point is that terraforming destroys indigenous ways of life and power, and it is a very deliberate part of European um, dispossession and seizure of land. It is not enough merely to, to legally seize and expel, it is to transform the land so that it cannot be used by indigenous communities. Um, that we, we will say in New England, um, drive Wampanoag or Pequot peoples away from their land and then turn it into an English farm so that they cannot return to it and that it will destroy the biology which sustains them. Two, I point out this, this is normalized over time. One of the reasons I, I talk about terraforming and talk about in my classes is because we barely notice it anymore. Um, we, we are living in the terraformed world. You, you drive through New Jersey, and that is just how things are supposed to look. But it's not true. This is neither, I don't want to say the natural state 
of the Americas, because a, a key part of what happens is that indigenous communities in the Americas, which had lived within and worked with and themselves shaped natural environments, right? Most of the forests of the Eastern United States were regularly maintained and burned by indigenous communities. So it's not a sort of you know, non-human natural environment, but we, we have so thoroughly transformed that we barely notice it anymore. And finally, let me say for many scholars such as myself, this is the root cause of the climate crisis and the sixth extinction event we are going through, that you, you cannot understand how we got to this point without understanding how we have transformed the very planet we live in, that in cutting down forests, in dispossessing indigenous ways of life, in changing the world's biology, we have set the foundations for the disaster through which we are all trying to survive. And as our first panel suggested, um, we are in many ways trying to return to a pre-transformed world, to a pre-terraformed world. Um, and yeah, I, these I think are just important ways that historical education can remind our students of how we got here and where we can go. Yeah, I actually remembered in your class, you mentioned like um, the whole like Great Plains thing was completely transformed. I forget like what exactly you said, but can you please tell me? Sure. I mean, a, a good example is um, sort of the southern part of the Great Plains, what is today Texas, Oklahoma, eastern New Mexico. In the late um, 18th, early 19th century, um, Comanche peoples um, used the grasslands, um, horses, and other ecology there to set up what some historians, for better or for worse, have called a kind of empire. Um, and it is because it is, it is a huge sea of grass that they can move over, um, that they know the, the food, the geography. Um, and after the 1840s, the United States government um, and sort of the settlers they are encouraging very deliberately convert that from an open grassland into enclosed fields, right? Most of this region, if we visit today, is cattle ranches and wheat and maize farms in some combination. Um, and that is, you know, a deliberate attempt to turn one kind of ecosystem into an artificial human food system. Um, most of us only encounter this in the grocery store, right? You, you, you buy a bag of food, you think it's great that it's made in American farms, but it is because we have turned one environment into another, um, into something quite different, um, and very deliberately to break indigenous political power. Yeah. Agreed. I could not agree anymore with what you said. Um, my second question I'm directing towards Ms. Barbara Landis. Colonization was not just about land grabbing, but also cultural genocide. And the residential schools were a big part of that plan, as Dr. Jack, as Dr. Bouchard alluded to. Um, the founder of the first residential school in Pennsylvania in 1879, Henry Richard, Richard Henry Pratt, is famous for the phrase, kill the Indian, save the man. Children as young as three years old were forcibly taken from their families and sent to these schools. They were not allowed to meet their parents or go home for five years in the name of reform, development, and assimilation through education. These schools affected generations of Native Americans. Can you tell us what happened in these schools, what went on? Ms. Landis, you're on mute. I guess I should unmute before I start talking. <laughs> I'm really honored to be here. Thank you so much for um, inviting me to be part of this. And I uh, just want to begin by um, saying that uh, I hope what I have to say, I can say in a good way. And, um, and I should tell you that I am here in what was founded as Penn's Woods after contact. So I'm a little bit west of where you are on the East Coast. Um, and at the time that the Indian School was founded in 1879, most of the nations had been relocated to reservations. So there's that transformation that had happened when Richard Henry Pratt came up with this model for cultural genocide, which by the way, is a totally appropriate way to describe what happened at these boarding schools. Um, and legally by UN definition, it is an example of genocide. So um, there's no doubt about what the purpose was. When Pratt used these violent monikers um, that we know of as like kill the Indian, save the man, he said that in his philosophy, 
and I, and these are going to be very harsh uh, metaphors that I'm going to be using. So I, I do want people to be prepared um, for this kind of triggering that can happen. But um, he used the analogy of Christian baptism. He said, we like to take these children and hold them under until they were, they're thoroughly soaked. And when they come out, they will be, quote, civilized. So there's that drowning metaphor, again, that violent um, imagery. Um, I, I did also, when, when I looked at your questions, Alec, um, it took me to my database and I started looking at ages because when you said as young as three, and I'm sure you heard that from me, I, that just triggered something in me as a grandmother, you know, that these ages, uh, ages three to 48, those are the ages of the children who were sent to Carlisle. There was one child who came in at age three and bear with me while, while I do these statistics real quickly. Seven came in at age five, 14 at age six, 24 at age seven. Now, these are all children who are being sent far away from their home communities for a, an extended period of time, three to five years, typically. There were 185 under the age of 10. This is out of a population of roughly 8,000, 7,800 children. 900 were between the ages of 10 to 12. 2,500 between the ages of 13 and 15. So now we've got almost 4,000 kids who are under the age of 15 during this period from 1879 to 1918, roughly 40 year period. 3,000 were between 16 and 18 years old. About 1,100 were between the ages of 19 and 20. So they're now past what we consider traditional school age. 664 were between the ages of 21 and 40. So now among these numbers are about 600 students. I say children, but they weren't that young. You know, they were young adults in many cases, um, about 600 of them were re-enrollments. So for some reason or other, they decided to re-enroll or the school decided to re-enroll them or they were on some kind of an assignment um, where they continued to work at the school. So that's a, a demographic of who these kids were. Now to what their, what their day was like, what, 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 what went on, you said, in these schools. Uh, the Carlisle School was an industrial and vocational training school and academic training school. So kids had academics for half a day, and then they learned some kind of a trade for the other half day. And those trades would have been non-skilled labor type trades um, in for the most part. So uh, males would be learning masonry, carpentry, blacksmithing, carriage making, um, and girls would be learning the typical domestic arts around the turn of the century, the turn of the 20th century, which would be, um, you know, cooking, cleaning, sewing, child care, which in effect prepared these students for work as domestics if they were female, they got jobs as maids or, you know, uh, child nannies. And for males, they would have been doing some kind of um, labor. The ideal trade in the eyes of the administration in the United States was farming, which is really ironic because these children came from very advanced and developed farming communities. I mean, it was many of their communities who taught the colonizers how to farm. So it's ironic that that would have been the emphasis. And then the children, when they went back to their home communities, were not typically living in arable lands because they had been relocated. So, you know, the ironies and the misfit about this whole philosophy was evident from the start. Um, I'll, I'll just quickly tell you, go on. Um, 
their lives were very regimented. They were designed into military units. So if you were a kid at one of these boarding schools, and there were 24 of them modeled after Carlisle, and incidentally, four of them are still in existence today. The Sherman Indian School, the um, Haskell University, um, I can't think of the others that escaped me, but and and their goals are the opposite of what Carlisle's goals were. Now the goal is to reclaim um, tradition and culture. But at Carlisle, they would have been put in uniform, organized into regiments and battalions. A ranking system would be set up. So they would um, set up this system among themselves where they were policing each other which is another psychological issue that um, has strong repercussions. And they wore uniforms, their hair was cut, as we know. And in the summertime, when you would expect to go home from boarding school, these children were sent out into non-Native families where they lived with the families and worked there. And if they were um, old enough, they would be paid a minimum wage. Um, there was um, music and um, debating, which was another part of this program, which kind of made Carlisle in some, in some eyes the elite of those schools because kids were taught to be able to stand in front of a group and debate the important issues of the day. So that was another aspect that was kind of unique to Carlisle. So that's, that's that in a nutshell. The, the system that you described at Carlisle resembles um, more North Korea than like here. And when I see the statistics, it just gives me chills. There are a lot of statistics. Yeah. And um, on that note, um, I will address my, I will address the next question to Ms. Jenida Benali. Ms. Benali, in a previous interview, you mentioned how you were forced to leave your reservation at Black Mesa to make way for a coal mine to, and move to Flagstaff, Arizona. What are some of the problems you have faced due to this? How is the present day infrastructure on your reservation in terms of healthcare facilities, water supply, school and jobs? Hi there, Yate um, Atalasitlo. Good morning, everyone. I am with you today under the shadow of the holy San Francisco peaks, the Ko'osli, which is sacred, which is holy to 13 tribal nations, but it is um, also culturally and historically significant to 22 indigenous nations here in the southwestern part of Arizona. Um, I am Diné, um Navajo, and I grew up um, in Black Mesa in Northern Arizona on the Navajo Nation, which is and was now now the uh, Peabody Coal Company is shut down. But um, I grew up at the uh, at the the hamlines of the of my grandmother's skirts at protests, um, always understanding that the land that we live upon is a direct reflection. How we care for the land is a direct reflection of how we care for ourselves, how we care for our community. Um, in context, also my father is a traditional medicine man and I have studied, well, I apprenticed with him for 40 years <laughs> and I've been working along alongside him now. Um, the the um the area that that I grew up in had um beautiful juniper cedar um pinyon pine trees we used to when I was little in different areas we used to go and gather medicine at places where we can no longer gather that medicine um Peabody was the largest open strip mine um, in the United States for the highest grade coal. Um, and the coal was shipped all the way. It was actually slurried um, using our water, um, our aquifer water. And it was said when the deals were being made, um, 
you know, before I was born, it was said that uh, with Peabody Coal Company and the Navajo Nation government, Peabody Coal Company had said, you won't notice how much water um, we'll be taking because it's like a teaspoon in a big barrel when we slurry all of the coal to um, to Nevada. Uh, that wasn't true. Um, the springs that my family and I um, used to utilize for drinking water all dried up. There was um, even our animals now, it, now currently we, um, we can't graze our animals there um, because there's not enough vegetation because there's no water coming up anymore. I mean, we are in a drought, but um, we also just, it doesn't exist like it did. Um, when you mentioned terraforming, Jack, uh, the land reclamation that happened in Black Mesa was, it It was beautiful. It was um, hills, rolling hills, mountainous. Um, we didn't have any valleys there. Now, the reclamation process that was promised to us when they said that they would bring the land back to its natural state, and we wouldn't even notice that uh, our land had changed, is actually been seeded with Kentucky bluegrass in Northern Arizona. And, uh, and there's valleys and, and such. So the land has been so destroyed by, um, by the rehabilitation from Bee Body Coal, Coal Company. Um, it's, it's a, you know, people think about these histories in Carlisle boarding school. And my father went to Riverside boarding school. He was a victim of the boarding school era. Um, and so when I was growing up, we talk about you know, the relationship to land. When I was growing up on and off the reservation, my family actually never relocated. We, uh, our family uh, has been part of the resistance that we would never relocate. We would never accept the accommodation agreement. We'd never accept a house or whatever it is that they were trying to buy us off with because that land is where my great, 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 great grandparents are buried. That land is where my umbilical cord and my my siblings' umbilical cords are buried, and so this is our homeland. This is where um, where our connection to Nehema Nahastan, our Mother Earth, is. And so, some of the face some of the challenges that we faced, of course, being removed um, from any site that is a homeland, even sacred sites, which are off reservation um, as well that have deeply impacted um, have deeply impacted our ancient living culture. Um, we have to we have to find ways, I think, today to be um, we have to find ways to inspire and motivate youth to learn our culture to learn our traditional ways, to learn the medicines. And, and it takes a bit more effort because so many generations now, uh, we're, we're looking at um, it, the, the relocation of over 14,000 of my people started in, in the 1970s. So over 14,000 of my people at that time were forcibly removed to gain access to the coal that is under our homeland. So then you look at, that was 14,000 people then, and you look at the, the, the children, the grandchildren, and now the great grandchildren of those families who were relocated, who don't have that connection to land. So we have to find creative ways. And I think being a musician is part of that, um, that creative way of inspiring youth to learn about our culture, to learn about your connection to earth, as, as well as my radio show, Indigenous Youth Nation. And Indigenous Youth Nation is actually, um, so it's it's a preteen teen 
radio show that focuses on normalizing and celebrating culture, um, re-identifying oneself, reinvigorating um, the culture, the cultural identity that we have. So um, it was actually inspired um, by um, a feeling of helplessness when we we, we, we as Indigenous people have always known about the the terror of boarding school, um, you know, from my father, from his experiences. It's not that far removed, and everybody needs to understand that. It's not that far removed. The father of my children went to a boarding school. He had no idea how to parent, no idea how to parent, because all of that had also been stripped from him. And while he was in boarding school. So um, finding ways to reconnect. So Indigenous Youth Nation um, was that, that response to people in the world finally believing Indigenous people that our, uh, that our, our young ancestors are buried at these schools, there's, I think, over 400 residential boarding schools in the United States alone. So how do we reconnect? Um, how do we re-inspire the younger generations to, um, to normalize culture, to feel comfortable and confident within culture? I totally agree with you. Um, and it's also like a shame too, like, I like, I don't think most people know that we even had residential schools in our country. Like, every, like, I think most people do know about what happened in Canada because there was a lot more coverage, but no one knows about it here. And being an immigrant, I also like understand the, I also understand and it can relate to the importance of like maintaining your culture and everything. It was very impactful. Um, it is, yeah, it's, it's so important for, you know, all peoples, but it's that connection. I, I want to mention that I also was a plaintiff. I sued the federal government um, to protect the Holy San Francisco Peaks. I lost that case, unfortunately. Um, but what was really, there's so many elements about that case that were so important. Um, the, the crux of it is that a small for-profit ski resort um, wanted to or they did they have now unfortunately they utilize reclaimed wastewater which is laden with endocrine disruptors which is not regulated by the EPA and they spray it on the entire western face of the holy san francisco peaks which is the sunniest side which means that all of that water then um drains down into the uh going lower into the Havasupai Nation, um, which is their only source of water. But that water that is the endocrine, uh, the reclaimed wastewater that's put on the Holy San Francisco Peaks um, means that as traditional practitioners, we can no longer pick our medicine there. Our medicine now has been so disrupted by the endocrine disruptors that if we as traditional practitioners utilize this medicine and it makes our patients sick then people will stop they'll stop utilizing our traditional medicine so it goes back to the whole thing of colonization and undermining the cultures the the traditional sciences that have existed for thousands and thousands of years and Going back to what Jack was saying with the terraforming, we've had these sciences, they've existed, that harmonious relationship that we've had with our mother earth and how we've been able to live in balance has been there, it is there, and it's not for, it's not a folklore, it's not a myth, it's not magic, but it's traditional science. Yeah, like if this is not like, like if this is not one of the terror, the tragedies of terraforming, one of the most obvious ones, I don't know what it is. Yeah. Um, on that note, I would like to address um, my next question to Dr. Bouchard. And this very much relates to what Ms. Janita like, said like just in the last question. Um, in your class, you mentioned that the Europeans were 
obsessed with the term improvement. The idea being that in order to possess land, you need to improve it. The literal meaning being that like to improve, you must alter or transfer the land. In what, in what ways was the land transformed and how has this affected native communities and the countries that were colonized? Um, yes, this, this, this is a sort of a, in, unfortunately, a perfect follow-up to sort of what we were just discussing. And actually, I, I want to talk about this um, in, in the context of Northern Arizona and, and Carlisle. Um, I mean, let me say, by the way, as a side note, I've actually spent a weird amount of time in Carlisle, and I never knew about the residential school um, because I, I've driven through there so many times. Um, but so if terraforming is the kind of physical um, aspect, um, the idea of improvement is is the the ideology behind it. Um, what historians who work on the 1600s have noticed um, is that as you are reading what Europeans are writing, especially the English in the 17th century, they keep talking about improvement. Um, we must improve, and only improvement is um, a sort of a, a way to legitimize possession. Um, so you know nowadays improvement is good. We all must improve. One does not want to write. It is, a, it is a word that connotes getting better. In the 17th century, it has a much more specific meaning. Um, as you suggested, it is to change a landscape or to extract something from a landscape in a way that they see as adding value to it. Um, so, so at the, the core of this is that in global perspective, European agriculture is actually incredibly inefficient. Um, growing wheat and raising cows is a terrible survival strategy. And one of the things is the only way to make it work is to radically change a landscape, right? Um, you know, when Europeans get to North America, you have to cut down forests, plow the land, inject fertilizer, enclose your, your pasture, enclose your farmland, and then wait, raise wheat and cows. Um, but according to 17th century English thought, that is improving a landscape. You are taking a non-European agricultural landscape and turning it into a European agricultural one. And by the same note, um, a landscape is only improved if you cut down the forest and sell the wood, if you dig up the resources underground and sell them. In other words, it is inherently about generating capitalist value. The point I would make, I, I, so take sort of two things that were said before, this example of Carlisle, I, this idea that white settlers are teaching indigenous communities how to farm is so insane. Um, and part of it is that um, in the East Coast, most indigenous agricultural systems are contrasting with European, incredibly efficient. Maize, squash-based agriculture does not require you to transform a landscape because, well, basically you don't need to plow anything to grow maize. I mean, irony is Americans now do that. Uh, not irony, it's very intentional. Um, so, But it is the idea that by the 19th century, settlers and Europeans think that only European-style agriculture is legitimate and adds improvement to a landscape. So that is what people have to do. And this becomes legally enforced. And as you pointed out in Carlisle, it, it is forced upon people. But then the, this example of Arizona, according to the logic of improvement, this 17th century idea, that coal mine improves the landscape. It is a net good. And all the, the beauty that you described about what existed before, but the fact that that landscape sustained human beings very comfortably in, in balance, does not improve or add value to the landscape. And the important thing is here that it, it is the latter, or sorry, it is the former. It is the adding of the mine that has legal and economic weight behind it, right? That mining corporation gets legal title to the land. A court is more than happy to enforce it. And the American GDP goes up. And therefore, everyone is happy except the actual human beings living there. I mean, I, I having recently purchased a house, I was sort of... Um, shocked and disturbed to learn that according to the kind of legal logic of the United States, if I add um, anything to my house, if I improve it in any way, whether or not it's good or bad, the value of my house goes up for tax purposes and other things. Like there, there is still a kind of um, economic and legal correlation between transforming a piece of property and value increasing. And my point here is that is something that, that is really um, coalesces in the 17th century 
And the key development comes across the 17th century when the English start saying, to improve a piece of land gives you legal title to it, right? If you farm a plot of land, that is yours. But conversely, if you don't improve a piece of land, you cannot own it, which is part of why um, in the 18th, 19th, 20th, and 21st century, so many laws do not allow indigenous possession of land, title to land, because they are not practicing the one approved style of agriculture, of resource extraction. It is very much um, baked into our society. Yeah. Very much agree with, very much agree with you there. Like, um, I remember like you were also like mentioning in your in your in your class like this exact same point like you like even if you like add something that like for example like you paint like you just paint your roof it'll increase the value of your house yeah you improved it i mean the poisoning an entire aquifer in in northern arizona technically generates gdp and is technically an improvement under the sort of logic of this um and the point is you know that's it's, it's, it's an idea we inherit from the 17th century and from the earliest years of colonization, um, that it's, it's, it runs through sort of everything and it incentivizes this kind of behavior. You know, when we ask, how are we in an age of climate catastrophe? Well, it's because the entire legal and economic incentive structure is to open a coal mine in Arizona instead of preserving a landscape for other forms of human use. You see, that's the irony of it. Like you're digging your own grave, so to speak. Like, uh, yeah, like you're just digging your own grave. Like lo the long-term costs will far outweigh any, like even like 0.1% increase in GDP. It's insane. Yeah, but for people in the 70th century, you know, they'll be dead by the time they feel the consequences. So they don't care about the future. Um, and, you know, to this day, if you do anything else, it is you are economically and legally, like if I didn't improve my house, the town would get angry at me because I'm not increasing the tax revenue of the town. Um, there's a great deal of pressure. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's not a happy story. It's a very depressing story. Um, but I think this is what we, we are obligated to tell our students. Um, and you can see how something happening in the 17th century is reappearing in the 1870s and it's reappearing in the early, you know, late 20th, early 21st century. It, it just, it's the same story over and over again. Like you cannot improve based on this idea and then expect to find a way out of the climate crisis. Like you can't do it. And this is why when scientists and engineers say, don't worry, we'll simply improve the technology and solve the climate crisis, we should be extremely skeptical. Yeah. With all due respect to our friends in STEM. Definitely, definitely. Um. Ms. Landis, my next question um, is, when I wrote about my research paper on the legacy of the intergenerational trauma at the Carlisle Indian School, I interviewed Dr. Denise Lajimodier uh, and I spoke to, her, spoke to her about how her father suffered abuse at a residential school be and, and became an abusive husband and father. It prompted me to interview other survivors and record their stories. And many of them are, dis are very disturbing. Um, did the residential schools teach valuable life skills and professional skills to Native American children? Were they able to assimilate in, in American society and find meaningful work? Or did they create an identity crisis in those who were forcibly sent to these schools and the students were left behind? Yeah, that, that is a question that should have been asked hundreds of years ago or 150 years ago when uh, Pra was continuing to tout this as the answer to the so-called quote Indian problem. Um, but I think I think it's helpful to take what uh, Dr. Bouchard and Janeta have said about um, this transforming process because you know you're looking at transforming land, you're looking at transforming resources to the detriment of the ecological systems. Now you're transforming forming human beings. You know, I mean, that is ethically and morally anathema to Christian thinking, really, and yet it's done in the name of Christianity. But but I digress, because you asked, were there valuable skills that were that that students learned out of these um, programs, valuable life skills, 
And, you know, students, especially the older ones, learned how to negotiate through these um, structures that many of them had already been exposed to through the mission boarding schools. You know, there were a lot of mission feeder schools to the Carlisle School. So by like 1890, students were required to have already had uh, four years of previous schooling. So students started to come to Carlisle knowing some English and prepared to succeed through the examination process. Um, but the way that students learned to negotiate was this kind of language of submission. And I'm sure that stood them well in many other systems outside the school. But, um, and that language, of course, had to be English. You know, students were punished if they were caught speaking their native language. So it was English only, which is another really problematic aspect of this training. Um, because, you, you know, you can learn another language, especially as a child, uh, without having to give up your own native language. So um, that was problematic. But yes, yeah, students came out of this knowing how to speak English, and knowing what makes the white man tick, which was another important lesson in order to negotiate through um, the dominant culture. But as you mentioned, the irony there too is most of these kids did not get swallowed up into the dominant culture. Most of them went back to their home communities with these very conflicted identities, um, Zikala Shah wrote a short story called The Soft-Hearted Sioux, which is a perfect example of this, about a kid who goes through boarding school, goes back to his home community, and is completely worthless, can't um, help out in any useful ways or traditional ways, and sits in the teepee and reads the Bible all day and is, you know, of no use to himself or anybody. So. You know, there is that example of how the experiment failed again. But there also were students who were on an academic track, so to speak, and males and females. And, you know, those were the students who ultimately went into Indian service and worked as bureaucrats or worked as teachers at other boarding schools or became nurses and work for Indian Health Service. You know, when I give programs at Indian Health Service, um, I often meet people who say, my mom, my grandma, they all went to boarding school, they all were nurses, they all learned nurses training through that process. And, you know, now I'm, I'm a nurse or I'm an administrator with Indian Health Service. So, and, and that would not have been, um, desirable in Pratt's eyes because he hated the Bureau of Indian Affairs, was always struggling and fighting against the Bureau and did not want students to work as bureaucrats. But, you know, he did not get, really give his whole philosophy and this whole structure was ass backwards. Instead of coming up with a, you know, a, a structure in the dominant culture to reject racism, you know, he, he tried to transform these kids who came out of this program and they still looked like Indians. And so, you know, they, they couldn't survive uh, in the dominant culture under the usual structures. So it, it's very problematic. Uh, yes, I'm sure they learned useful skills. I'll tell you, the athletes were the ones who were the most successful. Those guys who, I mean, you... When you look at what happened at Carlisle during the football era, at the beginnings of football, modern football as we know it was developed at this Indian boarding school in the early 1900s, late 1890s. And, you know, you had young men who were not huge uh, hulking figures, but they were very quick and very cunning. And under the uh, leadership and coaching of Pop Warner, um, 
you know, they were beating Ivy League teams like Harvard and Yale and, and West Point. They carried a limping Dwight Eisenhower off the field in 1912 when the Carlisle Indian School beat Army at West Point. So, and those were the students who really had agency. William Gardner became a famous Alaskan lawyer, or no, he was he was Anishinaabe, but uh, William Paul, I'm thinking of. You know, there are a lot of big names that came out of Carlisle who became lawyers, doctors, dentists, football coaches. Um, William Gardner was one of Elliot Ness's G-men. I mean, there's some really interesting professional stories that are born out of this, outside of Jim Thorpe, mind you, um, that we can look at as people who certainly develop valuable life skills. But, you know, most did not assimilate and most of them did go back to their home communities. Yeah, because I remember from the from when I wrote the paper, um, quite a few of them, like they weren't accepted in the dominant mainstream culture, but they also weren't accepted when they went back to their own communities. Like they were seen as like, I guess the word turncoats, I suppose. Well, yeah, I mean, Luther Standing there, who was Rosebud Sue, wrote a book. He wrote several books. One, My People the Sioux, um, is, is an example of what a typical day would have been like, what his experiences were like. And um, he and actually eventually went to Hollywood and was um, working hard at casting Native and Indigenous people into Native American roles in those old movies. So, um, you know, he's an exception that really stands out along with many others. Right. Since I know we're um, hard pressed for time, um, I'm gonna ask like two more questions and then open the floor to um, Q and A if that's okay. Um, my, I have a question for Dr. Bouchard, since this is like very topical to what Ms. Landis and Ms. Jen Ada said, like I, I wanna skip to you and ask this one question. Europe, the Europeans were obsessed with the idea of legalizing conquest and they did it through many ways. Can you shed light on some of them? How did they justify their plunder? Also, what are the, some of the long-term effects of this on indigenous populations and are steps being taken to reverse this? Yes, I, I will I will try and keep this brief, but you know, you learned this in my class. It's one of the things I like to explain because it's so counterintuitive. What 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 seems like sort of lawless, reckless dispossession, colonialism, all of which it is, Europeans from the 15th century onward are compulsive about proving it's all legal and fine and good. Um, and this includes the these huge inter-European international treaties like the Treaty of Tordesillas. This includes treaties between European and later settler states and indigenous communities. But this also includes things, um, what historians often call ceremonies of possession, where when a European colonizer first arrives in a piece of land in the Americas, they will do a very public ceremony to show that they are legally taking possession of it and its peoples. Um, so famously, the Spanish from the 1510s have a thing, um, a requerimiento, where they will, when they encounter an indigenous community, read a legal declaration aloud in Spanish, which they believe grants them um, possession of the peoples there. And therefore, if the indigenous community resists, they're rebels and they could be exterminated. Um, a couple of things I point out. Um, one, this was all about proving to other Europeans that they were legal. The indigenous perceptions did not factor into account, right? Reading a treaty in Spanish to Mexica peoples, clearly this is about convincing other Europeans. Two, this becomes part of the United States legal system. Um, in, in the early 19th century, in the early American Republic, the US Supreme Court especially draws on these older European treaties and legal precedents to basically set US law. So um, the, the foundational case, Johnson v. Mittentosh, I think it's 1821 by the US Supreme Court, which continues to be the legal basis for indigenous land law in the US, which says indigenous people have no legal title to any land, um, explicitly draws on like 15th century European laws. The final thing I'd say is 
even beyond the laws, it, it becomes a real important part of American popular culture. So the holiday of Thanksgiving is implicitly about justifying occupation and dispossession, um, right? If you think of the story many of us were told as children, think of the Charlie Brown Thanksgiving special, um, the sort of message of the story is, well, it was okay for the Puritans to settle New England because the Wampanoag people sort of implicitly invited, accepted them, helped them out, and then had a meal together. It, it is a, a, a ceremony of possession in which a shared feast legitimizes occupation. Um, and at least in, until recently, that was just a staple of American popular culture in the media. Um, so in all of these sort of different levels, in, in these international treaties, in these active real-time ceremonies of possessions, in these legal precedents for land law, in popular culture, there is so much anxiety among settlers and Europeans to make it okay. Um, and we are the inheritors of that. Uh, and and to, to quickly answer your last question, the, the inverse is that since many of these things took place in writing with treaties, it does in the settler legal code allow for pushback and contestation. Um, I would point out in Canada, many indigenous communities have been very successful, um, especially in the past two decades about um, using these treaties to reassert rights um, and titles and to say, you know, it is in writing, the government has to recognize this. Um, it, it is much more contested historically in the United States, but it is starting to be a path forward. I mean, I'm, I'm not terribly hopeful because you can see how much it's based in, but yeah, that's the irony of, of improvement and terraforming is they want to prove that it's okay. Right, agreed. Um... Unfortunately, I, I, this discussion is very, very interesting. It could go on all day, but unfortunately, we're we're I'm out of time. I want to thank you, the three of you, for all coming again, coming again, uh, coming. And Miss um, Janita, do you? I don't think I've asked you enough questions, so I'm just going to ask you: Do you do you have any final words that you'd like to share with us? Thank you. I I do actually. Um... You know, we're still facing so many of these issues that where there is um, where there is an environmental crisis, there's a cultural crisis. Um, indigenous peoples are being impacted. And so it's really up to us, each person in each of these little boxes of technology right now, it's up to us to decolonize the concepts that that we've that we've become so accustomed to, to this normalization of taking, of destroying, of finding solutions through, through building and creating and destroying more, but rather coming home, coming home to your heart, where right in your heart, your own indigenous roots still pump from when you were in your mother's room, womb, from when she was in her mother's womb, going all the way back to the beginning of time. There's that one indigenous concept that you all have, that we all have, that we have to relearn. And it's so simple, it's called respect. It's respecting our environment, respecting ourselves, our community, our family, all of this, all of the life giving properties that our mother earth and that our father sky give to us. So how do we go forward? Each of us making decisions each day because those decisions are not for us. They're not for us right now. Those decisions are for your great great grandchildren how are you impacting them very true we're very true how do we prevent the sixth extinction hmm. i think um there's I one th question i know from uh, professor born maybe she can uh, say something um yes um please what is your question Yes, thank you so much. Really loving this panel. I just want to say I'm Helen Bond. I'm a professor at Howard University. And literally, I work with pre-service teachers. I teach in the School of Education. I was just talking to them last week about the Carlisle Indian School and how these issues are often taught. Uh, and so that's where my question is. I was sharing with them that often Native American history is taught so historical that there is no present day application. So what can you say we've had teachers and students on in terms of the best ways to educate students about 
the Carlisle Indian School and some of these issues going forward. Um, so I answer that. I'll try to answer that. I think the best way is um, to just make sure that you make people aware that these schools existed and pay attention, especially to the work of Deb Haaland, the Secretary of Interior, who has issued a report and is investigating what happened at these boarding schools now that the um, subsequent generations are willing to talk about it. So I would encourage you to read that report that was published by the Secretary of Interior and you know, just um, swallow up as much as you can that comes from the voice of descendants. That would be my advice. Any other questions? And look, unfortunately, we are running out of time and our panel uh, is here, but I would suggest to please, if the panelists and you can share uh, the emails in the contact uh, chat list, I think that will be very helpful to follow up. Of course, I will do so. May I have a, a comment, please? Of course. Thank you. I did my MS degree in Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul, and I had uh, the chance to visit the Sioux uh, community in a reserve, and just the term reserve made me so sad at, at that time, really. And uh, I feel that uh, the American indigenous people, I have them in my heart, e even though I'm Moroccan. <clears throat> so here in this panel, really, uh, I have real uh, tears in my eyes now, right now. Why? <clears throat> A country, a huge country, that <clears throat> almost, I mean, all the time that the saying they are fighting for democracy in the world, <clears throat> and within their country, they are not uh, uh, doing it. They are not giving the dignity to uh, a real part of the uh, of these communities and uh, <clears throat> and humans within the, the U.S. I don't know why. This is my question. <clears throat> I'd, I'd like to respond if I may. Um, when the draft declaration of indigenous peoples was being written, um, I was there at the United Nations giving testimony and I, um, I got the opportunity to speak right after the United States government. And one word that they refused to use <laughs> is genocide. And there's a lot attached to that. I was like, why can't you just say the word? <laughs> why can't you just say that this is what has occurred? By definition, this is genocide. Um, this is a cultural genocide. This is uh, an environmental genocide. So it's it's how do how do we move forward? How do we how can we move forward? How how can we heal? these wounds that exist, because these wounds are still very real. They're still very open. Uh, we're all being, um, we're all being affected and infected by that. So how do we heal these wounds? Um, moving forward, you know, democracy, as, as you mentioned, democracy, it's, it's a principle. It's a, the foundation comes from the Haudenosaunee people. Um, it is an indigenous concept. So bringing all of that back that, you know, bringing all of that back to really um, taking ownership, I'm sorry, is the most difficult thing to say for anybody. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And having Deb Howland right now, we have so many incredible indigenous peoples who are who were originally grassroots people working for their communities that are in political office right now and that's that's how we move forward and that's how we make positive change is by doing what you can speaking the truths that do exist reminding people that um 
you know, it, it, I do sometimes consultations with museums and I remind people that don't just list the white people in the pictures, <laughs> list the indigenous names as well, because we're more than props. We're people too. And our history is, is really, um, it is a heartbreaking history. It is a heartbreaking now. It's a heartbreaking present day now. But when we recognize that there are wrongs, that means that there is room for us to make things healthy, to work towards healthy solutions, to work towards bringing our communities together in a way that that is respectful. Could not agree more. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. Um, I thank you all for coming. I truly appreciate it. We had a great discussion. And I'll give the floor back to Dr. Ayangar to introduce the next panel. Thank you, Alok. Fascinating panel. Uh, I'll ask uh, Jasmine to take over. Sorry, we're yes. running late. Uh, then yeah. no, we won't be able to take comments. But thank you so much for being here with us and sharing this uh, uh, history that we have all forgotten. Thank you. Yes, I, I 